Welcome, my friends, to a very special installment of the Far Post podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Lemieux, joined, of course, by my co-host, Elizabeth Pajota. Elizabeth, how are you? I'm good, Jeff. How are you doing? Fantastic. Very excited about today's show because we are joined by someone who will live in Boston sports lore forever for being the man who closed out the first World Series championship for the Boston Red Sox in 86 years back in 2004. Mr. Keith Folk. Keith, you're a very, you're a very busy and important man. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us. <laughs> yeah. Hey, no, no problem. A lot of, uh, a lot of downtime during this uh, pandemic, whatever it is. But uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Glad we could finally do it. Yeah. The, the first question, obviously, we're living in pretty strange times. So I guess the most important question, how are you doing? How's the family doing? Uh, I'm doing well. I'm out in Arizona, uh, hanging out with my mom and kids, living at my mom's house temporarily. So <laughs> making the best of it, but, you know, if you're going to be stuck anywhere in Arizona this time of year, it's not a bad place to be outside all the time, hiking, mountain biking, so staying active. How's the weather down there? Uh, it's beautiful. It's starting to warm up. But we went from being in the 70s and 80s last week. Now we're 90s and 100 this week, but, you know, even 100 in the desert's not too bad. You're still in Boston most of the year, right? So you, do you just spend, typically spend winters in Arizona? Uh, well, I've been in Arizona last, well, last three years, last three okay. winters. Okay. So, uh, I would come back and visit here and there. I have a house here, but I, my buddy is written it from me and all this. So that's why I'm at mom's house right now. But, uh, yeah, I spend most of my time in Boston, still working with the Sox and the minor leagues. So, um, it's, it's nice to be, it's, it's, you know, it sucks that we're going through all this, but it's nice to be able to spend some extended time back here. Yeah. But for those who don't know, what is your role? with the Red, Red Sox organization at this point? I am, uh, the official title is I am a bullpen advisor for the uh, player development, which is the minor leagues. So I roam around between uh, Pawtucket, Portland, and Salem, Virginia, and uh, work with the young uh, minor league pitchers, the bullpen guys specifically, working on getting them prepared. And, and uh, when they get called up to the, to the big leagues, that they're ready to go. Now, obviously you spent time in Boston as a player, and then your career took you several other different places, but besides the job opportunity, I guess, with the Red Sox, what, what was it that, that brought you back to Boston when the Red Sox wanted to get you back involved in the organization? What was it that you said, yeah, I, I want to go back to Boston. I want to be part of that club. Uh, well, the Red Sox are a very unique organization as far as I know, where they do a great job of keeping former players around. And, and fortunately, being part of that 2004 team, uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, public appearances and stuff like that where, uh, you help with the Red Sox and the Red Sox Foundation with, you know, with charities and, you know, going to visit people and, you know, little speeches here and there. So uh, I was I was going back to Boston quite a bit and I started to pitch this idea to, you know, to the front office, you know, a couple a couple front offices ago. But about the one position in baseball and minor league baseball that doesn't have a coach really is the bullpen guys. And so uh, they finally took me up on it, and I started dating a girl in Boston just over seven years ago. So everything kind of fell back in place, and, you know, I kind of just uh, put that last piece of the puzzle together, and, you know, that's what brought me back and been happy ever since. Keith Boston clearly has a really special place in your heart personally. When you were there three years as an athlete for the Red Sox, how special was it for you to play there as an athlete and be a part of that iconic Boston sports landscape? Well, it's uh... – you know, it's kind of a funny story because being an athlete in Boston is obviously there's extreme highs. Uh, you know, 04 and, you know, the beginning of 05 was obviously incredible. But, uh, you know, as a, as a former athlete, uh, one of, before I signed, Bobby Orr called and told me what it was like to be an athlete in Boston. You know, there's good you know, positives and, and, you know, there's a lot of negatives too. When you're doing well, <clears throat> excuse me, when you're doing well, no better place to be an athlete. But – when you're not doing so well, the, the Boston, New England fans know so much about you and about the team, there's no escape. So it's, it can get very draining, and, and it got to be midway through the 05 season where my legs started to hurt and I was having surgery and, you know, the career kind of took a nosedive. It, it can be tough because you can't ever escape uh, the height, the, the fans, you know, which is, you know, depending on what state of mind you're in, can be very draining at times. And that's why when I left, it was, you know, I was 
happy to go. <laughs> it was time for us to, you know, to break up, but, you know, time heals all, all wounds and we came back together. I know you work with a lot of young players now who are aspiring to be athletes who play in Boston. So how much do you talk to them about you know, what it's like to be an athlete in Boston and having to kind of embrace, as you mentioned, the highs, but also kind of knowing what comes along with having a fan base that is very demanding? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question because a lot of what we talk about it, you know, it's probably 50-50 on 50% baseball and uh, maybe more 60-40 of baseball to off-field, uh, you know, your personal life with your <clears throat> your girlfriends, wives, whatever it is, you know, a lot of single players still, but it's uh, it's managing the entire baseball life. Uh, so much of what happens away from the field and, and once you do get to Boston, you're kind of put up on a, you know, a pedestal where doors are open for you and, and there's a lot of times that not every opportunity is a good opportunity you know you've got to learn how to control your your nightlife uh you got to make sure you keep your you know keep your <laughs> keep your tail out of trouble and uh so you know and, and with your relationships and, and traveling on the road you know there's a lot of aspects to being uh, an athlete but when you're putting in when you're playing in a place like boston or new york where there's constant media constant eyes on you and with all the social media now athletes are never out of sight you know I, I i feel that i was fortunate to play back in the 90s and early 2000s when you know just the camera started to get smaller you know where you could put it in your pocket and we'd be at you know at bars and stuff and it's like hey no no pictures in the bars and nowadays when when every person has a phone that's why you catch all these guys you're never out of sight and you're never i mean you're always just within an inch of, of doing something stupid and getting in trouble so we, you know, I, I preach and I teach a lot on my mistakes, you know, trying to have these guys not make the same mistakes I made. You did mention, though, the highs when you're an athlete in Boston can be pretty high. And you had a pretty big high in 2004 winning that World Series with the Red Sox. And how quickly did you realize that that team and that accomplishment was going to be the moment that it was? I mean, Living, living in Boston my entire life, seeing Edgar Renteria back to the mound, gloved by you, underhand to Mankiewicz at first base. I mean, that is the moment that you see constantly. When did you realize that you hadn't just gone out and won a World Series, you had won a World Series in Boston after 86 years, and it was going to be this moment that you were essentially going to live in Boston sports history forever? Yeah, well, the, the story starts out in 03, you know, we, I played with Oakland 03. We lost to the Red Sox. So um, I was at home watching the Yankees Red Sox series on, on TV, just like everybody else. And it was, it had kind of started to come up that my agent, you know, told me that, Hey, you know, Boston's probably going to come after you. My dad says, you're going to be a Red Sox next year. And I was like, eh, we'll see. You know, I enjoyed, I enjoyed playing in Oakland. It was easy and all that. But when I decided to come to Boston, the the thought obviously you have the dream of winning everybody does that's why we play the game but it was we were I, I was you can't play even as a visiting player in Boston and not know the history the fans let you know we sit in the bullpen all the time and I would constantly talk to the fans which is it's fun and you know sometimes it's good sometimes it's bad but you know you know the history it's very well documented but when we came to Boston in 04 we came there with the we were, we came to win, you know, we had that, um, not only was a dream, but that was our mission for that year. And obviously when it was all said and done, you know, it's, it was much greater than we anticipated, but you know, the parade and you hear the stories and, you know, still to this day, I still hear stories from fans all the time about, you know, where they were, uh, about, uh, what family members and friends were able to see it. The ones that weren't able to see it, you know, and how they still, you know, go out to the, the cemeteries and celebrating with the, with the ones that have passed. And, um, you know, it still kind of brings chills to me that it's, it's you know, that's the only reason I'm here, right? If we don't win that year, there's no way I'm doing this interview. There's no way I still live in Boston. <laughs> so, we're, it's, we're... Um, yeah, it was just, it's the greatest thing ever happened in my life. And, uh, you know, I'm very honored to be a part of it. We're glad you won, and we're glad that you're here doing this interview because we both grew up in, in New England, so we're Boston sports fans. So uh, that, was, that was huge for me when you won in 2004. I know we have a lot of Boston sports fans listening to this interview, watching this interview, 
who are getting chills as well, thinking about that 2004 World Series, but they might be wondering, this is awesome. They've got Keith Volk on the Far Post podcast talking about the Red Sox and the 04 World Series. But what's he doing on the Far Post podcast? Exactly. And the reason we have you on the Far Post podcast is because you've been pretty active in interacting with the Revs on social media. You've been a, a pretty vocal Revs fan for a little bit. So just kind of tell me where, where the Revolution fandom started for you. How did that kind of originate? Yeah, it all started in uh, probably in 04, um, where, you know, I talked to, actually it was in 05, where it was, there's times you need to get out of the city. You know, I'm a country boy. I grew up in East Texas. So it's like I, you know, I was practicing uh, social distancing long before this started. So there's just times where I need to get out of the city. And then uh, one, one Saturday afternoon, we played a day game and the Revs were playing. I'm like, hey, I want to go. And so uh, I would start to go to games when, when I had time. And uh, I didn't know anything about soccer. Wasn't around it growing up. Was in probably four, four or five counties where I grew up. But I, as I started to learn the game, uh, I started to appreciate it a little bit more. Uh, when you watch it, live, you kind of tend to see a little bit more. And, um, you know, there's some uh, – I, I like the physical aspect of it, and there's some things I don't like about it. But, you know, I just started to learn the game. And once I learned the game, I started to appreciate it. And uh, I'm a big hometown guy, and I adopted Boston as being, you know, one of my homes. And so it's – you know, I just fell in love with them and, you know, enjoy it still. Keith, you mentioned, you know, you came to your first refs game and you started to learn more about the games. As you became more knowledgeable of the sport and, and the game, what did you find out you loved about being at Gillette Stadium for refs games? Uh, well, being at Gillette Stadium was pretty, you know, pretty cool. Uh, but it, it's, you learn, I learned what great athletes they are. You know, they're, it's, you know, you see little bits and pieces here about, you know, guys getting tapped and they're taking the flops and, you know, once you start to learn why they do that, but how physical of a game it really is and how skilled the athletes are, um, you know, their conditioning, their, the footwork is what I find incredible. Um, you know, the being able to see, you know, it's a pretty big, let's call it the pitch, pretty big pitch that they have to be able to know where everybody's at and the teamwork. It's similar to hockey in a lot of ways and how they, the quick passes to, to free a guy up and, and get after it. So that's, that's kind of what started, uh, you know, my love of the game. And it's grown. I love watching uh, international matches now, uh, especially on Saturday and Sunday when you wake up or when we had sports. You, you turn on a TV at 8 o'clock in the morning and you got, you know, matches going on. So I can honestly say I'm a, I'm a soccer fan now. Do you have an international team that you follow closely or you just like to watch the game? Uh, I enjoy watching the game probably more than international. Uh, obviously, the, the Liverpool being part of the, the Fenway Fenway group. Uh, and I've got a close buddy that's a uh, Barcelona fan. So um, he's always talking to me about it. So I'm like, well, if he's going to chat at me about it, I guess I should start to pay attention. So you know, it, it's growing. I mean, obviously, I'm not there, but it, the passion's growing. I know you were following all, along a little bit last year as the Revs had uh, a pretty big turnaround, changed the, the entire technical staff back in May, brought in Bruce Arena. You turned things around, and the Revs got back to the playoffs for the first time in a few years. And as someone – who's seen what it's like to be an athlete in Boston with the Reds back on this upward trajectory. How important is it to be a winner in Boston? If you want to have that respect, you want to be part of the conversation. How important is it to be winning consistently? It's a, uh, it's, it's the consistent part that, you know, the fans want, you know, obviously nobody wants to go out there and, and spend their time watching, you know, teams that don't play well and lose, but, uh, you know, the winning part is in, in having a winning tradition in Boston is it's there's a lot of pressure on those guys, um, you know, especially since, you know, the Red Sox have won and, you know, the Patriots, obviously, they look at those banners all the time. But, you know, the having successful teams, all four of the other teams are, you know, are champions in the last 10, 15 years. So I think it puts a lot of pressure on the uh, on the players, the staff and, you know, the organization as whole is to put a winning product on the field. You know, they start winning and they keep winning and they keep this uh, upward trajectory. You know, the people are going to come. You know, you're always going to have your diehard. Um, can't remember what the fans are called in the one end zone, but you know, it's a it's a very energetic game, and you know, the fans want to go out there and see winners. Yeah, we've got the we got the Midnight Riders and the Rebellion in the fort behind yeah, the goal. Story, yeah. Our supporters. <laughs> I apologize that I forgot. I've talked to some of those guys over here, so I kind of forget. Uh, you're you're good. And uh, Keith, 
we know that you've been a Revolution fan for quite some time at this point. Do you have any favorite players that you had throughout the entirety of your fandom? Yeah, uh, Charlie Davies. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to meet him a couple years or a couple times. Um, I took my my younger sons to a game a couple years ago, and you know after his playing days, but he was on the sidelines, and uh, so we got to watch a guy warm up, and he was over there, and uh, got to talk to him a little bit and take pictures. So, you know, uh, especially with social media, it's a lot easier to keep up with guys, uh, you know, in the the lives off the field and what they're doing now. And so, yeah, that's. Uh, that's the one guy I have to say that, you know, I would say is my favorite player. We'll have to have you guys all back once soccer is finally back at Gillette Stadium. Yeah, let's, uh, you know, let's hope that's that's coming soon. You know, it's like you said, it's they had a great year last year and, you know, they kind of changed the tide of the organization. And, you know, let's hope that, you know, everybody can, can get back to normal life here pretty quickly. Yeah, we're all looking forward to sports getting back, obviously. How important do you think – sports are going to be as we get to that point when everybody's trying to kind of get back to that normalcy of everyday life. A lot of people talking about how sports are going to be one of the most important elements of people kind of feeling like things are back to normal. Uh, you know, being an athlete, obviously I'm a little biased, but being just a normal person now and, you know, how we're all going through this together, you know, it's, I find myself missing sports way more than I thought I was. You know, I'm sitting here watching the pool masters and stuff on TV because it's like, man, there's there's nothing to watch. Uh, and it really is. It's a gathering place for people to go escape, a lot of times escape normal life. Um, and I think once sports come back, it's going to come back in a huge fashion. Uh, and hopefully we're able to do it in a very safe, um, you know, atmosphere. But um, I think people are really, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, when you have stuff, sometimes you get – it's kind of blah, but now that we've been without it for a while, I think it's going to come back in a huge fashion. I think the passion from the fans can be a lot greater. Uh, I think the players, the athletes themselves are going to have a little more respect for that. They have a job, you know, and they're, they're able to go out and do this. So I think uh, sports is a key, um, you know, key backbone to this country and well throughout the world. And, you know, similar, you know, but similar, but not similar to when uh, in 2001, nine 11, you know, when, you know, we took a couple of weeks off, but when we came back, you know, we came back with, uh, with the pride of, of what we did. And we came back to help give the, the people a little escape from, from real life. And as all of these leagues begin making plans to eventually come back, including Major League Soccer, it does seem like there's a lot of conversations, a pretty good chance that those first games back in most of the leagues could potentially be quote unquote, behind closed doors in empty stadiums with no fans or limited fans. So as someone who was an athlete and played in a packed Fenway Park every day for, for three years, what are, what are your kind of thoughts as an athlete on what that's potentially going to be like for guys getting back into the game, but doing so uh, in a little bit of a different atmosphere? Uh, it would, it's going to be huge change for the guys. Um, you know, I've, I played in Boston for only like three, three years, but I played as a visiting player for eight, you know, so there, there's a lot of times that your home field can be good for you. It can be bad for you, but as a visiting player, uh, I think Kurt Schilling said it best years ago, there's no better feeling as an athlete being able to shut up 50,000 people with, with your actions. So the fans and their interaction and, and their energy with the game is a huge part of it. Um, you know, they can take you up another 10, 12, 15%, whatever it is, you know, with adrenaline. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's bad, just depending on how you handle it. But um, they're professionals. I'm sure, you know, it'll take them a couple games to, to get used to it. But uh, once you get in the heat of the action, you know, it's um, – you should be able to flow right back into it. And, you know, we have TV now, so I'm sure they can uh, make something happen, make it look like people are in the stands. <laughs> I know in South Korea and South Korean baseball, I think they're putting, they're putting mannequins in the stands with jerseys and hats on. Yeah. So there's going to be a little trial and error there. I think uh, you talked about, it'll be, it'll be nice to have them back on TV. That's, that's yeah. what I, I can't yep. wait for. Yeah. You know. That's huge. And I know you talked a little bit about, about being impressed by, uh, you know, the athleticism of, of soccer players with footwork, obviously every athlete in every different sport has the traits that make them elite in that sport. I mean, obviously you talk about baseball players and you think of, hand-eye coordination and precision. And for someone who is a closer, I'm sure mental toughness is a huge part of that. As you've kind of watched soccer and learned soccer a little bit throughout the years, 
what is it you think are, are kind of the traits that separate soccer players and guys who play soccer from, from the athletes in, in other sports? Um, well, obviously they're, they're cardio, but it's the, it's the footwork. It's the, uh, you know, their body control, being able to, um, you know, drive, be able to get by somebody, be able to dribble the ball and, and the footwork with the ball you know, is, I mean, it's phenomenal to me. I mean, it's unmatched in any other sport, but, um, you know, the control that they have over their lower half and their body to be able to, to make those moves and, and get around people and pass the ball and be able to see, um, you know, and real speed, you know, it's like they're going to pass the ball between the guy's legs. Okay. You know, I need to do this, but you know, basically it's that footwork that, that astounds me. That's why I watch the game Keep and the plays and the teamwork. And keep knowing these traits of soccer players that you just named. If you had played soccer, what position would you have been? Oh, I don't know. I've probably been, I don't know, a forward, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. I've probably been a goalie, actually, because I have a hard time, uh, even when we play dodgeball, I have a hard time getting out of the way. So, uh, you know, I, I'd probably actually be a goalie. A good barrier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We we do have a player I, I, on the current roster, Scott Caldwell, who for a little while, a few years ago, we were calling – the closer, because every game we were up a goal with about 10, 15 minutes left, he would come off the bench. He would help close the game out. So he kind of earned this little nickname for a while, the closer. So I guess you could, that might be most fitting. We'll have you come off the bench with about 15 minutes left. We'll have you help, help you shut go. things down. And we'll have, we'll have <laughs> you close things out. That worked for you? That, that's perfect. I mean, that was always my motto. You know, you only work 15 minutes a day, but you make a full paycheck. So <laughs> I, always, I always said I was smarter than the rest of the players because they work all day for a paycheck. I only have to work a few minutes. Hey, closers, smart, smartest players on the team, man. As long as you're doing well. And if you're not doing well, <laughs> you know, that's why it's, it's, it's the, you know, you're the hero or the goat. You know, it doesn't go both ways. You know, you talked about, uh, about teamwork and we talk about the traits that make individual players great, but you also know the kind of the traits that make a team great. You know, having been part of that 2004 World Series team, what is it you think that are kind of the defining traits, characteristics of a team that, that has what it takes to, to lift a trophy? You know, it, the biggest thing is, uh, is going to work every day with one goal in mind. Uh, I'm not really sure how many guys are on a soccer team, but you have to have a locker room filled with guys that have the same agenda. You know, you have to be able to go to work every day and enjoy it because there's nothing worse than going – and on a team that's not doing well, you know, you got uh, 25 guys and they all have separate agendas and you can't get together and it's, it's a painful experience. So having a, having a locker room that has every athlete that wants the same thing, you know, and if they don't, they're quiet about it because there's nothing worse again than having an athlete that's not on the same page and is vocal about it. And it's just that, you know, they call it the cancer. You know, when you get cancer like that, it's hard to get rid of, you know, somehow you got to try and shut it up or you got to kind of cut it out and send it on its way. And, you know, through every team and every history, of sports, there's always one guy, you know, there's always that guy. And, um, you know, you, you know, in 04, we were fortunate to where we had a great team. You went to work every day, you know, everybody has, uh, has their own thing to do, but you know, when you, when you get on the road, you start going down the road, you're going straight. Oh, I'm so popular today. So popular. And uh, hey, you're going, you're going straight, and everybody's going uh, together. You know, when you get on that bus, it's like, hey, we're all going the same place, and we love doing it. I know you've uh, you've posted some pictures of Bruins games too. I know you've been a Bruins fan. Did you have a chance potentially to see the Zoom call that the 2011 Bruins team did this week? They they basically got like 20 of the guys together, and they watched Game Seven in the Stanley Cup Finals from 2011. <laughs> did, you, did you see or hear about this? I, I did. I saw something on, uh, I think it was on Twitter or something where I saw where I didn't know what they were doing, but now that you talk about it, now I understand. But yeah, I saw where they did something because people are saying, Hey, we need to get the four socks to do that. But um, I don't like, I don't read too much of the story. I just kind of look at the pictures and, and yeah, yeah, buy yeah. It. <laughs> so that in that call, you had all these guys back together who had won a title together nine years ago. But the bond amongst that group was clearly so tight. And a lot of the guys talked about the fact that even though it was nine, 10 years ago, they never, they never had quite that same experience 
in a locker room as they did when that team won a title. So when you look at 04, does that kind of create a, a lasting bond amongst a group like that when you go through something like that together and you accomplish a goal like that together? Absolutely. Um, obviously, when you when you win a title, it's the greatest thing in sports. I mean, it's why we play the game. But, you know, there and there have been titles won by teams who didn't get along. They were just great athletes. But there is nothing better than winning a team or winning a championship with a team with the guys that you truly love. You know, and um, I'm sure that 11 team had it. We had it in 04 with, with the Sox. Um, I think the 13 and 18 teams also, you know, were very tight knit teams and you have that bond and there's nothing better than going to battle with a brother and then, and winning, you know, because there's, there's ups and downs to every season, you know, you're never going to dominate completely. So you have to be able to, to experience those ups and downs to, to bring that bond tighter. And, you know, it's something where you are literally for, for one year, you are the best team on the planet. And there's a very prideful moment in being able to say that. Keith, you mentioned, you, sorry, go ahead, Elizabeth. Keith, you mentioned that, that tight bond. And, and one of the other aspects of having a team that is so close and working towards that goal is the buy-in. What was the buy-in for that 04 team uh, that kind of glued you guys all together? Well, a lot is, is the, a lot of that 03 team came back. You know, so the, um, there was only a few pieces like myself for chilling. Uh, were a couple of the key ads to that team. But for, you know, besides a handful or just a few guys, most of that team was the, was the same team that lost in 03. And there's times where there's no better motivation getting your butts whipped, you know, on a worldwide stage to motivate you to be better. So in, there, in a lot of experiences, <clears throat> losing is the best motivation and you learn from it. You learn what the mistake, what mistakes did we make? How do we correct this? And so I think a large group of the guys who lost in 03, me being one of them, because I lost to the Red Sox in the playoffs. So I took my experiences from losing in the previous playoffs. You, you, you get better. You're more mature. You handle different situations differently and you make yourself better, you know, for yourself and for the team. Keith, before we let you go, I got to ask, it's been, it's been 16 years. How many times do you think you've seen that final out in 2004? Um, a lot. <laughs> you know, <laughs> do you ever cool watch it yourself or is it when it comes up other places? Oh, it's just when it comes up other, <clears throat> excuse me, other <laughs> places. Uh, and I know the, um, uh, a lot of the sports channels have been playing a lot of the games. So seems like once a week I get a bunch of uh, shouts from, hey, we're watching uh, game four, we're watching game seven, you know, whatever it is. So uh, my mom doesn't get any of the sports channels here, so I don't see them. But, um, you know, it seems like it's uh, it's getting played a lot more while we're, you know, while we're in downtime. But it's one of those things that I enjoy it. I respond to all of them. And um, you know, like I said, it's, I'm a, it's the greatest thing I ever accomplished, and I'm proud an honor to be, uh, I was able to be put on that stage and be still be remembered today, you know, 16 years ago. And here we are, <clears throat> you know, that's a, that's an honor. Keith, it's been an honor to have you on the far post podcast. We appreciate so much. You taking the time as a Red Sox fan, I'm rocking my Fenway gear today. Thank, oh, yeah. thank you for 2004. Really appreciate it. Thank you for your revolution fandom as well. We'll look forward to getting uh, the guys back on the field soon and getting you out to a uh, Reds game. Yeah, we'll have to do that this year. We'll figure out and we'll get to, get to meet. And, you know, I'll keep uh, working on my knowledge. I'll give me a roster and I'll start working on names and stuff. And uh, I'll be a better fan. All right, we'll Sounds quiz you good. when you come out. You learn the whole oh, don't do it. that. <laughs> too, many head too many head injuries. <laughs> right. Keith, thank you so much. Stay safe. Stay safe with the family. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right, Elizabeth, Jeffrey, thank you guys. And uh, we'll see you down the road, huh? Thanks so much, Keith. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you soon on the Far Post Podcast.